I have the following program for today. So at first we'll look into the concept of an outliner. Then we'll look into what is network thinking? Why does networking thinking uh, matter? And then we'll dive into the fundamentals of BlockSeq, basically tying it all together and seeing how it all works. Um, all right, if there are any questions beforehand or comments, uh, feel free to speak up right now. Otherwise, I'm just going to uh, take a sip of water and get started. Um, Let's see, Adam, what, what, what is narrow? Oh, well, I am on a gigantic screen. So I'm like on a 32 inch screen. So uh, if you say, well, it's a lot of wasted space, that's because of my screen. Um, anyway. Yeah, and uh, Lily, uh, good, good comment. Uh, narrow is readable. There's actually, before I, I nerd too out, uh, out too much about it, but basically there's an ideal, ideal uh, number of characters per line. If it's too much, you tend to, uh, to lose track of where you are. So uh, we, in, in Loxy, we have optimized that. I know other tools like Rome, they, uh, they allow you to set the, the width. Um, that's not yet in, in Loxy, but just know I am on a gigantic screen. So I've zoomed in quite a bit now. Hopefully it's, it's readable. All right. So let's get started with um, introducing LuxSeq and basically the fundamentals of an outliner. Why do I start with this? It's because if anything, if you have to leave in like 10 minutes, I want you to take this uh, away from the session that first and foremost, LuxSeq, it's an outliner. I know I've named this session um, an introduction to network thinking or graph thinking uh, using LuxSeq. That is not the core principle of LuxSeq though. It's basically an outliner. And if you're familiar with outliners like DynaList, Workflowy, that is the core of LuxSeq. It's built on top of a graph database though. So if you're familiar with Rome or even Obsidian, uh, Obsidian also, it's a markdown editor built on top of a graph database. And we'll see in a little bit what that means. Um, the core unit of, of information in LogSeq is therefore the block. So each bullet in LogSeq uh, is a block and that will enable us to do a lot of cool things. I know this might be a little bit basic to most people, but I want to start at the beginning. Um, and what outliners help you do is they help you structure your thoughts in a tree-like structure. So. Um, there are two main principles. You have the leaves, so the individual bullets or blocks, and then you have branches. So just like you have a tree, and in the case of LogSeq, you can see your entire nodes database as the tree, and then you have different branches, which are basically collections of blocks, and then the individual blocks are the leaves. So what is a branch? This entire thing called onboarding session that is a branch. This is the main branch for the session. And this branch has sub branches, for example, introducing LogSeq and Network Outliner. That is another branch. So those are the core principles. If you have ever used a mind mapping tool, that is a tree-like structure. Um, a mind map is essentially an outline. So hopefully that, that helps you uh, think a little bit about what the structure is. Um, when we talk about graph databases or uh, graph note-taking tools, like many people say, oh, it's structureless. That is not entirely true because LogSeq, it's an outliner. There is some kind of hierarchy, maybe not in the form of folders, but definitely in the form of branches. So uh, again, maybe very basic, but this main block here, introducing LogSeq and network outliner, that is a parent block. And it's the parent of all the blocks that are underneath. But let's just dive into the fundamentals uh, of an outliner. And we'll see a little bit more what the implications are of LogSeq being an outliner and why it works so well for people who um, are easily overwhelmed. So I always say I have ADHD. 
I have the attention span of a goldfish. Within four seconds, I can be distracted if there's too much information on the screen. So in this case, there's way too much information on the screen. So I'm just going to zoom in on this part for now. And we'll see uh, in a bit what that this is one of the core fundamental features of an outliner. But the first fundamental is uh, indentation. So like I said before, there is hierarchy in LogSeq. You have parents uh, blocks and you have child blocks. And I have that um, shown here in this image. So block A, it's a parent. Then block B is a child. Block C is a parent and a child. And block C is the parent of the D block, which is a child. Blocks B and C, we're not going to dive too much into it because the implication, like, there's not a lot of implications to it, but B and C are siblings. So to be complete, you have basically three types of blocks in LogSeq uh, or any outliner. You have a parent block, you have child blocks, and then you have sibling blocks. So the sibling blocks are on the same level. Um, the way LogSeq works, but also tools like Roam, the sibling blocks cannot see each other. So it, it's not really important for the hierarchy. So that's why we're not going to dive too deep into it. Um, so that is fundamental one. From that fundamental, there is um, a, a second fundamental that automatically basically, uh, or it's very obvious uh, fundamental, which is expand and collapse, which is expand and collapse. Well, I'm going to click on this little arrow and now I expand this branch and now I collapse it. That is that is basically the the, the most the easiest uh, way to understand it just by showing. What is the implication? The implication is that you can very easily go from a high level overview. I like to say like a 30,000 feet overview to detail view. And by nesting blocks, you can basically create different uh, detailed views. So very, very important uh, fundamental. Not every outliner has this, even though it's like most outliners have it. It's a very core principle. Uh, for in, in LogSeq, it's very important. Um, so that is fundamental two. Fundamental three, I've already shown it. Um, again, not a core feature of all outliners, but definitely of the, the more complex ones like LogSeq. By clicking on a block, you zoom in, so or you focus on a block. So uh, while being able to expand and collapse, being able to click into a block uh, gives you way more, or how do you say, how do I say it? Way uh, better view to filter out the noise. And just give me one second because I hear some people are on mute, have unmuted themselves, which is a little bit distracting for me. So I've just muted everyone. Sorry for that little interruption. Um, fundamental four, again, uh, now we're getting deeper into the fundamental features also of, of LogSeq. This is not in every outliner, but it's uh, basically the consequence of having a block-like structure. It is uh, having a sidebar. So instead of opening it here, I will hold the, the shift key. Uh, again, this may seem very basic, but for many people, it took months to discover that LogSeq has a sidebar. So I hold the shift key and now I open this branch in the sidebar. Why is this useful? It's useful because uh, using the sidebar, you can basically have different branches open um, and you, that, that way you can see information in a new context. So I can open several branches or even entire pages in the sidebar and then in the main window, navigate to another page and see that information in a new context. The way I use it often is I do a lot of research uh, for articles. I basically open all of my notes in the sidebar that I want to use. And then in the main window, I open the draft uh, of, of the article I'm writing on. And then um, I can just drag over blocks from, from the sidebar. So very neat feature. Um, if you do a lot of writing um, and create outlines. And then basically uh, the, the final fundamental is very quick entry uh, because outlines are structured by indenting and you can just collapse blocks. You can use the sidebar. 
quick entry is just almost a given. And then uh, the way Logseek does it, it's using the journals page. If you're familiar with Rome, in Rome, this is called the daily notes page. So every day you get a new page with today's date and you can just scroll down um, to anything that you've uh, written on, on your journals pages. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because you don't have to think about where you put your information. It's very important um, for newcomers. I always hear, oh, do I create a new page or do I write on the journals page? If you're new to Logseek, I would say, just write everything on your uh, journals page. Don't worry about where you will put things because you have an anchor in time. Your, your journals are, uh, your journal entries are like it automatically uh, gives it a place where where your your information lives. So uh, really, to reduce cognitive loads when you're uh, taking notes, just do everything on your journals page, and you should be good. So these are the fundamentals of uh, outliners. I'm going to take another sip of water and then see if there are um, any questions. I see people who say it's still too small. Should I zoom in more? Is it is the text really that small? I'll just zoom in it just a little bit more. Okay, now it should be better for people on small screens. Um, let's see if there are other questions. Mm. Okay, so let me have a sip of water and then continue with what is network no, uh, thinking. I struggled a lot with uh, answering this question. I even asked on Twitter, uh, how do you explain network thinking? Um, some people came up with uh, really good anal uh, analogies, for example, having pictures, like just picture a, uh, a mystery or a crime show where a crazy detective has all kinds of snippets or photos on the wall and they connect uh, all the photos with yarn, just with little uh, red, red uh, yarn. That is basically what network thinking is. So you try to connect things with each other. Another analogy I hear a lot is personal Wikipedia. So if you picture Wikipedia, you have an article and in an article, you can have many links to other pages. That is basically network thinking. So you create a network of notes, uh, but it has some implications. Um, many people coming from tools like Evernote, Notion, even uh, Obsidian, they do not really understand the implications of Logseek being an outliner, first of all, and then second of all, uh, it being a graph database. So uh, you, in, in, a, in a normal hierarchical uh, thinking tool or a note-taking tool, you have an image that, oh, sorry, you have a, a, a note that can be uh, uh, in a folder and that can be in a folder. So basically every note has one uh, location. In like uh, in in Luxac, in uh, in Rome, I would even say in Obsidian, that is a little bit more nuanced. So even though uh, Obsidian is strictly a hierarchical uh, note-taking tool, you can create links. So if you're even if you're familiar with with uh, Obsidian and you think yeah, but I just have uh, always had notes that were in folders you can still create links between nodes, no matter where they are. Um, in LogSec, you have like a block has a place either on a journals page or in another page, but the location doesn't really matter because you can directly link to a bullet. So um, like I say here, in a net network thinking tool, data doesn't have a fixed place. So even though it is on a page or it is on a journals page, it doesn't really matter because you can directly link to that piece of data. Um, and why would you, or when is basically a graph database useful? 
it's not it's when you the data itself the notes itself um, are not the main like uh, don't have the main value in graph thinking or uh, in network thinking the relationship is way more valuable than the than the information in the um, notes themselves and that is basically the the basics of network thinking so you have atomic pieces of data which wherever they are it doesn't really matter because you can link them that is another uh, very important principle of network thinking and then the third principle i would say the value of your notes in a network database or a network thinking tool comes from the relationships between the data so uh, i will see in a bit how how that works uh, in loxy um, why does it matter um, and this is this is a lot. So just try to avoid reading everything. Just read the 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 bolded parts. But in a normal note taking tool where you have a linear document, you basically are loading a lot of stuff into your brain. So unless you have very short pages, uh, you run the risk of overloading yourself because our biological first uh, brain um, has a very limited working memory, like about four items. So we need a second brain. That is why this uh, Tools for Thought space is really uh, booming now because like business problems, personal uh, lives getting more and more complex. So we have a need to offload some of our thinking. But then even if you use a tool uh, like Evernote or Notion um, that basically store all the notes in individual pages, you can still run the risk of, of overloading your, uh, your working memory. So, uh, network thinking or a network thinking tool tries to eliminate this problem by making um, it, it easier to create atomic pieces of information. The way Loxic does it is by dividing everything in individual bullets. So the way I write notes, as you can see here, I have one thought or one idea per block that is that is my uh this is basically my principle when i take notes is for every block i just have one idea that also makes it easier to link different ideas together because i can just link to another block which also only contains one idea i don't have to load a bunch of ideas in my in my memory when i'm working with a large page i can just link individual uh, uh blocks um, the problem with most note-taking tools nowadays, although it's obviously changing with Blogseek and with Rome, also with uh, Obsidian uh, to a lesser degree, is that most note-taking apps, they try to emulate uh, basically physical the physical form of notes. So you have a piece of paper that you can put in a folder, but that piece of paper can only live in one location. And that is basically how Evernote or Notion approach note-taking is you have one one note that can only live in one uh, location as we'll see in a bit with block references and embeds uh, that is not really the case in Loxic. A, a note can live in many different places at once um, and i already mentioned this uh, a note-taking tool that can connect individual notes let's just create a, a atomic notes so meaning one idea per note and that is basically how I treat note-taking in Logseq. And the way I see it is this, this parent block is not one note. This parent block uh, onboarding session is a collection of notes and each bullet is one note. Uh, in another tool like, uh, like uh, Evernote, you would not cut up your notes uh, in, in this way, like you wouldn't create a single page for one sentence or two sentences in an outliner like Logseek, that is very natural because you can just hit enter and you create a new note in another tool, you would need to create a new page first. So that is why it's really frictionless and you can, um, really write at the, the speed of thought and create new notes at the speed of thought. Um, all right. So. Now it's time to dive into the fundamentals of uh, Luxseek. I see some comments 
about the name. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, is it Lock Sack or Lock Seek? Der Derek is asking. Uh, many people have that question. Uh, there, there's a little bit of a discussion, even within our team. Some people say Lock Sack. Um, I say Lock Seek because it's basically a lock sequence. So uh, looking at the journals page, I just think, oh, it's a log sequence. It's a sequence of logs. Uh, so that is why I say log seek. Some people say log sec because they think, oh, it's about security because it's privacy first, whatever. It, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, everyone will, uh, will understand. Um, let's see, Scott, how to change the date format for each day in the journal? Good question. So uh, the date format that you see here, that is, I think, the standard. But if you go here in the in the top uh, right, you see the three dots to open the, the menu. And I click on settings. You go to the editor tab, and then you have the preferred date format. So for example, now I have the month uh, abbreviated to three letters. I can select the one underneath. This is a little bit esoteric, I agree, because not everyone is familiar with the, the, the date annotation. Uh, but if I would choose this one, it would uh, change it to the entire, let's see, it would change to the entire month. And I need to do a re-index. So again, also something very important, I would say this is also one core feature or core uh, thing you, you do in, uh, in LogSeq is whenever you have a change that applies to your entire database, like uh, your, your date uh, notation, you click in your graph name and you click re-index. And then it will basically load in all the files again. And as you can see now, the, the date format has changed and now it shows the entire month's uh, name. Um, let's see, Eric, how do you get the hover highlights for branch structure? I don't know what you mean. Is that like this? Is that what you mean, Eric? Um, let's see. He says, yes, uh, this is out of the box. So, uh, this was recently implemented, obviously custom themes can target this multi-bar as we call it. Um, but when you hover over it and the line becomes thicker, that means once I click it now, everything will expand. Um, but this is actually the standard. Uh, I have the standard theme right now, just light theme currently. Um, so no, no custom CSS uh, in this uh, graph. Let's see, what are some other questions? Mm. Yeah, um, also, uh, Aryan, good, good comments. If you don't see this line change, uh, this is a new change. So make sure that your app is in the, like it has the latest version. I have updated, I think this was released in version 0.5.7, I think. So make sure just click check updates and then uh, you should get a notification. Um, Carol's asking, can you add images? Uh, yes, I don't have an image right here, but let me just download this image if I can. So as you can see here, um, I have this image, I cannot, right click it i see let me see can i no um but yeah the, basically the way you would add the image is just by dragging it into a block and it will automatically upload it to uh, uh into logseq um under the hood you will have a folder and i'll just show this in my if i it's not let's see let me do sorry just bear with me just want to somehow it's not, ah, sorry, it was here. Um, so in the LogSeq folder, hopefully you can still see my screen. I have the onboarding. Under the hood, LogSeq will upload everything to your assets folder. So as you can see here, I have here an image and just let me demo it 
uh, uh, doubt. Send it away. Hmm. This is not good. I should have. Sorry, just bear with me for a second. I want to properly demo this. All right, better. So I could just drag a image just here. Like I can just drag an image onto a, let me create first a new. So yeah, so now I've created a new block and I can just drag an image in and then it will be added. As you can see here, it will be added again to the assets folder. So that is how it works under the hood. Also really important, obviously, when you come from Rome, this is one of the pain points when you migrate away from Rome, that people ask, hey, how do I get the images with me along? Uh, the way it works in Luxeek, they live on your computer. Nothing gets sent to our servers, everything works locally. So a uh, very important principle as well. Okay. There are no more questions. Let me check the chat. Um, then we'll, okay. Let's see, no more questions. Um, Ross, this is the last question I'm going to answer for now. Uh, are there plans to implement more org mode features? Uh, I have no idea, to be honest. <laughs> um, we currently focus on the majority. So uh, Markdown, the, like most users use Logseek for Markdown. So that is our main priority right now. Okay, let me continue with the fundamentals of Logseek because that is obviously why you are here. I've already shown a little bit. So one of the, the fundamentals is um, everything that you place into your graph lives on your computer. Again, nothing is sent to us. Uh, that is very deliberate because we are a privacy first, no taking tool. Um, we are working on a sync service. So if you want, you can opt in in whenever we, we release the service, and then you will be able to choose if you want to sync your database um, with our servers. Again, encryption is super important. Part of our team uh, is uh, in, in China, for example, and they use it themselves. And if you know a little bit about the situation in China, you will, you will know that like privacy is super important uh, for them. So that is one of the reasons that we have the philosophy that we have. We don't want to know what is in your notes ever, never, ever. So that that is, uh, I would say, one of the core principles. Um, then I've selected five fundamentals and I've already uh, dug a little bit into the, the journals page, but we'll look more why that is important. And then we'll uh, dive into basically the 20% of features that will uh, give you 80% of the results. And we'll go from the journals page all the way to queries. And I think queries is what confuses most people, but we have about half an hour left, so it should be enough. Um, all right. So the journals page, I will run th uh, through this very quickly, but again, if you ask yourself, should I create a new page or should I write on the journals page? 99% of the time, your answer should be journals page. If you just have some random thoughts, whatever, first entry point is your journals page. Why? It's your anchor in time. We humans, we think to either, uh, we like normally we think either in spaces. So that's why I think many people uh, ask themselves, should I put this on a page? Or we think in time. Um, Obviously, when you have to decide before you write something down where you're going to place it, that is already cognitively taxing. So uh, me, myself, personally, I've so many times lost an idea because when I was still using Evernote, I first had to create a page, had to decide where it would live. And often I would forget the idea. Not with Logseek because I just have the journals page. I open Logseek and I also have the, the uh, iPhone app. So fire up Luxie, can start writing within a second. So that is basically one of the main reasons why you should uh, write on the 
uh, journals page. Then use pages for distilling or grouping related information. So for example, when you're working on a project, uh, all the project related notes, just put them on one page. I have pages for individual projects. Still often I will use the journals page to quickly enter my notes. And I just add a link and we'll see in a bit how that works. I just add a link to the projects page. And then once I'm on that projects page, like maybe once every few days, I just drag the blocks from my links references, which I treat as an inbox. And we'll see what link references are in a bit. I will just drag it from the link references onto the page. So that is basically the, the easiest way to start using BlockSeq. Uh, again, with the journals page, you don't need to think where to put new information and your notes get automatically date stamped. And we'll see under queries why that is important because basically you can look for notes within a specific time frame. So that is very useful, but the prerequisite is that that note lives on your journals page because only when you write on the journals page do your notes automatically get date stamped. So you can obviously manually date stamp it and we'll show in a bit how that works, um, but the, uh, it, it automatically happens whenever you create something uh, on the journals page. All right. Um, then blocks. I've already touched on this, uh, but every bullet is a block. Um, there is no alternative to the block. So some people ask, can, you, can I write in just a linear page? Yes, uh, you can. There's even a shortcut. I can type TD. And now you see the bullets disappear. But hey, I hover over them and the bullets are still there. So yeah, you can hide the bullets. Personally, I don't like this view. Um, some themes do this better. Uh, unfortunately, the default theme is not really nice. If you ask me, I like to write like this. So uh, even though there are pages, but pages are just collections of blocks. So again, the smallest unit of information is the block in other apps like Evernote, Notion, um, that is the page. That is the, basically the, the smallest unit of information. And then blocks can be combined in branches. I'll already touch on this, a branch to repeat. This is a branch. This is also a branch because here you have the top block is the parent block and then the nested block is the child block. And pages themselves, I just see them as collections of blocks. So the page title, in, like mentally, I picture it as, as the parent block. So the page name is just the parent block. All the blocks that are on the page are just child blocks. So those are the principles of blocks. Um, many people miss this fundamental. Um, I've also noticed, so I've been using Rome for almost two years prior to switching to Logseq. This is what baffled most people. They're like, hey, but I have, you can create pages and stuff. Yeah, but it's still a collection of blocks. So everything is a block basically. All right, so now we're getting into the juicy parts because links, and I see I made, I messed something up when I was copying stuff over. So we'll delete this for now. Um, there are basically three flavors of links. Um, remember that Logseq, it's an outliner, but it's also a graph-based tool. And a graph-based tool gets its value from the links. How do you create links? The three ways, you can create a page link, you can create a block reference, or you can create an embed. Uh, starting with the page links, there are two ways, uh, which are basically the same. You can create brackets. So using brackets, these are called wiki links in uh, the Tools for Thought space. And you have hashtags. Um, for many people familiar with hashtags on Twitter, it works basically the same. Um, is there a difference between the two? Um, it's cosmetic only. So the functionality is the same. It, no, regardless if you use wiki links or the bracket links or you use hashtags, they work the same. So if I uh, shift click on the brackets link, you will see, and we'll see one of the, the, the another important principle is here, a linked references. So at the bottom of every page, 
And also, uh, so the brackets uh, here, this is a page called brackets and it has linked references. So anytime, this is another very important principle is every link creates two links. So one to the destination and one from the destination. So in this case, on this page, I created uh, a link to the brackets page and on the brackets page, I have uh, also a link and that link is shown in the linked references. If I go to the brackets page itself, now I have it opened in the main window. Um, you can see it's at the bottom of the page. Um, if I add more links to the brackets page, so let's say from today's page, I've now created another link. And as you can see here, it's automatically updated. So anytime you create a link to a page, it creates a link back also to where it was linked from. Very useful. Um, this was one of my pain points with Evernote because I would never know where I had linked to that create that that caused me to often copy paste stuff and uh, that in turn led to duplicate content so this is i would say a uh, very important um if you want to reduce um repeating yourself in your uh, your notes uh tags work similarly so i hold shift i click on tags as you can see here it just works the same way the difference between tags and brackets is I can create link with space with uh, using the brackets. If I would do the same using a hashtag link with space, you'll see what happens. Only the word link is uh, linked. So I haven't created link with space. I've created link. So I click on this and you can see here, the page link was created. Um, to use a hashtag in combination with uh, uh, several words, you would need to also put brackets around it. And now I click on it and I am taken to the link uh, with space page. Um, why the difference? So some people use uh, tags for, um, for basically, uh, categorization, whereas pages they use for um, more detail view. You can basically create your own workflow uh, around this. Uh, with uh, CSS, you can also target um, uh, tags using queries. You can also target tags specifically. There's also a plugin that lets you uh, search tags so it's pretty versatile, but out of the box, it works the same. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into this right now um, before I confuse you. All right, another way to link. So again, pages are just collections of blocks. What if you want to link to a very specific block? Um, there are two ways, um, basically, to create a page, uh, sorry, a block reference. I can right click on a block and I can say, copy block ref, and then just paste it here. You'll see this ID. So this is a unique ID uh, that refers to this uh, block. I click out of the block and you will see uh, this link, or oh, sorry, this block gets basically mirrored here. Whenever I change the source block, for example, by bolding this, you see the uh, the block reference also gets changed. Does this also create a, a bi-directional link? So two links, yes, as you can see here, this is this little counter, there's a one. And if I click this one in the sidebar, I will open the uh, all the instances where uh, this, uh, this block is referenced. So as you can see here, this block is referenced underneath block references. If I want to reference this underneath test data, which I'm going to do right now, you'll see underneath test data, I have basically uh, referenced it again. And you can see this counter updates because I have referenced this block twice. Uh, there's another way I can reference this block. So let me 
delete it from here. And holding the option key, and please excuse me, I don't know what the, the, the key is in on Windows. I think it's Control or Alt, you need to check it. But if I hold the option key on Mac and I click this bullet, you see this little plus sign appear. I just release and it's not always super fluid because now it got added at the end of uh, this branch, but I just created a new link. There's actually a third way. I just realized I can just type double brackets. Uh, sorry, uh, double uh, sorry, double parentheses. Double parentheses. Double parentheses. And then type two links, and I also uh, reference it again. I hear someone has unmuted themselves, so I'm just, again, going to mute everyone. Sorry. All right. So these are block references. Um, finally, there are embeds. There are two types of embeds, block embeds and page embeds. So you can basically embed a block or embed an entire page. Um, I like to use the analogy of a block reference basically being a window to another block. You cannot touch it directly because there's a window in between, uh, whereas a page embed uh, is more like a portal. So I will just create a page embed for this one. So I can right click on the block, click uh, copy block embed. And then let's just add it to the test data. I paste it. You can see it's still the block reference, but what happens now is it's actually embedded. And as you can see here, I can add more text. So I can actually, where I have embedded it, I can directly change the block. Um, as you can see here, it changed in the original place, but it also updated again, all the block references. Um, block, uh, block embeds are very useful because normally a block reference only creates one, uh, only shows the block itself. But if I would copy this block uh, embed of this branch, you'll see what will happen. It doesn't just show the block itself. It will show also all the children. And again, I can add text here. So that is the main difference between a block reference and a block embed. The two ones are a block embed, you can directly edit and it will update in the original place. So it's like a portal. But then also when you uh, block embed a parent block, which has child blocks, it will show all the child blocks as well. So that is uh, one of the most uh, uh, important differences between the two. All right, let me check if there are any questions. Mm. Let's see. Uh, Amy, how to hide the bullets. Um, so the way you do it, it, it's a shortcut. So without having any block uh, uh, selected, so the cursor shouldn't be in any block, I first hit the T and then the D button, T, D. And if you, oh, let me see, if you see, let's see here at the bottom right, you can open the help menu and there is a, a page called keyboard shortcuts. And that basically shows you, let me see where it is here. So under toggle, you can see here toggle document mode. So it's TD um, shortcut. I can actually modify it, which I'm not going to do right now. I like the, the standard once, but here you can see all the shortcuts and you can actually uh, change them. I hope that answers your question. Um, what else? Uh, butter, some resource, uh, butter links to some resources in the chat about um, 
links versus text. Thank you, uh, Butter. Um, let's see. Steven uh, says I like to generate embeds from PDF references and edit the embeds. Um, yeah, that doesn't work because a PDF file, you cannot edit from, from uh, Luxseek. So you can only reference um, um, highlights you make from uh, PDFs because otherwise you would change the PDF file itself, which is not uh, possible. Um, Jonathan, don't block embedded parent block into a child block. No, you get like basically an endless loop. It will just keep, I, I've done it before. It didn't crash lock seek, but it just created a gigantic page. So yeah, look out that you don't embed a block and then uh, uh, embed it in, in the same parent block, basically. Um, what are the use cases for page embeds, uh, Scott asks. Very good uh, question. Uh, again, by the way, please prepend your question with the word question. Makes it easier for me to filter. But uh, Scott, use cases for page embeds. I know people who create basically um, dashboards using page embeds. So they have a page where they have everything related to a project and then um, they have, they are working on several projects. So they just, uh, add page embeds underneath a parent block so they can easily collapse it. But yeah, that, that would be the main use case that I can think of for, uh, the page embeds. Mm. All right, let me continue. So these are already just with the journals page, the blocks and the links. Like once you understand this and block references combined with the, with the sidebar, you can already do a lot of cool stuff. So I use Logseek for writing. I just collect notes on my journals page. I have, when I, whenever I read a book and I export it out of, uh, Readwise, I use Readwise. I just have a page for a book and then I create basically outlines for whatever article I'm um, uh, writing and every block, I can just reference it and put it in an outline. And then I can even see in the outline how many times I have used uh, a highlight in another outline. So that's, that's very cool. For most people, this is enough. Some people want to take it a little bit further and they also want to combine their tasks with their notes. And I see uh, I've been jabbing a little bit too much. So sorry, I will probably go a little bit over time, but just check uh, the recording. Um, tasks, it's a, um, there, there are a few flavors. So again, via settings here, you can choose what flavor you want. The the standard workflow is now slash later. So you create a new to do and it will automatically, I think, become later. Uh, with to, uh, this flavor, when you create a new to do, you just type to do in all capitals or you hit command uh, return or uh, that's on Mac or control return on either Windows or Linux, Linux to create a new to do. Um, so that is the flavor I like. And then let me just demo it. So now I am holding the command key and I hit return. And as you can see here, I create a new to do, um, new task. I click out of the block and it turns into this little checkbox, which I can just check. If I've checked it, as you'll see it's now marked as done. So, uh, that is basically how to do's work. Very simple, but you can do quite some cool stuff with it. Uh, apart from the to-dos, there are also priorities. So you can, um, if you're using some kind of priority framework, uh, there are three priorities, uh, uh, namely uh, A, B, and C. How it works is you just type slash A, hit enter. And as you can see here, it will add a priority. Uh, I click out of the block. And you see, hey, it disappears, nothing happens. Well, that is because you also need to add a to-do and some text, I realize. And that is how it basically works. Um, by hovering over it, you can change the priority, like 
to either B or C, as you can see here. So um, very uh, neat. Personally, I don't use it. I just have to do's and then I organize them in uh, order that I want to do them. Like I don't like very complicated workflows, but you, you can use this and then you can basically write queries that listens to this. Um, there's also a thing called time tracking. Again, go here in the top right, go to settings, and then you go to, uh, sorry, to editor. And then you have this uh, option when enabled, which you can do time tracking, uh, which you can do uh, then instead of uh, just having the to-do and either marking it as done, you can click the status. So in this case, to-do, and you already see uh, when I hover over it, it says change from to-do to doing. So look at this time. I've already run it for a little bit and you can see here, I hover over it. I can see when uh, I changed the status to doing. So now it's two minutes, 31 seconds. I click it, I'll take a sip of water in the meanwhile but it will basically start counting up. So let me change it to, to do again. So I just click doing again, and this will have run up and you can see here, uh, it has just run for 21 seconds. So if I hover over it, I can see the logbook. Uh, this is very useful to, if you basically work on tasks and you want to know how much time you're spending on something. Um, so these are the flavors, prior priorities, and time tracking. Um, someone asked about uh, org mode today. So in org mode, you have scheduled and deadline. So uh, again, this is a little bit more of a complicated tasks workflow. Personally, I don't use it, but the way it works is in org mode, the way I've understood it. You give the scheduled date is when you are supposed to start something. Let me bolt that. And the deadline date is when you attempt to finish something. Um, by using these, uh, this, so let me turn this into uh, a new schedule. So I just hit schedule. I can add a time and date. For now, I will just use the date. I can even add a repeater so I can have a recurring task, basically. And now, as you can see here, January 6th, it will show up on the date. So again, basically just like a linked reference, it will show up uh, on the date that it's scheduled. So that is uh, for scheduled and then the same way, basically for deadline, they work the same. I'll write slash deadline, hit submit, I scroll up. And now I also have uh, the, the deadline here. So that is how deadline and scheduled work. Uh, personally, I don't use this, but I know many who do, especially people coming from, um, from org mode. All right. A lot of talking from my side. Let me quickly finish up with queries. So to create a query, and a query is basically um, you, you put in different filters to fetch all the blocks, to find all the blocks that meet that condition. And we'll see in a bit how it works. But the standard is you just write slash query, hit enter, and then you get the query short code. Within these, uh, like after this, you basically put in filters. So you have and, or, not, between, page property, to do, uh, and also priority. There are a bunch more. I'm not going too deep into it, but basically you would uh, write and, and then include links. So I use double brackets and I have some test data here and I want to fetch all the blocks that have a meeting link and in this case, Alice. Just click out of the block and this one block is fetched. If I have another block meeting uh, with Claire, it doesn't show up. If I 
But if I create meeting with Alice, you'll see it will show up. So basically I treat it as a safe search. Um, I use this, for example, for content calendars, uh, for workflows, um, and there are a few. So I have the and filter that you can use, the or filter, you can even combine these. So here in this case, I want to see all the blocks that either mentioned uh, uh, Alice or Bob. And then you can see here meeting with Alice, Bob is not in sight in this block it is. So it doesn't like it will find both blocks. Um, it will also find stuff that is in a uh, like in page properties. So here I have the page Alice and I've given uh, in, I've given in the, uh, the page property, I mentioned Bob and this will also show up. Then there's also a way to exclude. So I want, in this case, I want to see all the blocks that uh, show Bob, but not Alice. So, um, and as you can see here, it shows this page because Alice itself, it's the page name. So it's not, it's not the block. Um, then we have between. So this basically looks at dates. And here I say, I want to see all the blocks on the journals page between January 1st and January 4th. So it does not contain any uh, other, other blocks. Um, and then there's also page properties. And I know I've run really quickly through this, but I will put the link to the documentation page in the chat. Um, and you just look at, um, at the queries page. You also have page property, which creates actually a little table. So if you have some kind of metadata that you use, for example, if you have uh, a bunch of highlights from books and you have uh, in the first block of a page of a book page, you have the metadata, you can basically create little uh, tables that are very neat, I would say, to uh, to fetch like uh, uh, all pages that meet a, a specific condition. So in this case, I have a query. I want to see all the pages that have the metadata manages. And as you can see here, the page here, it has Bob and Alice. Those are the pages. And then it retrieves the all the metadata. So if I scroll up, as you can see here, uh, I have the metadata manages phone and email and you have that here as well it also has the created ad and the updated ad of the page what if i only want to see the phone number i can click this little gear wheel which says set properties and i can just disable some of the uh, what was i going to say yeah on my phone and it filters out basically all of the noise then finally before we wrap up with question and answers. And again, sorry that I went over time. Um, this, like queries are also very useful for to-dos. So this query here, if I go into the code, it searches for all blocks that have a to-do with a status to-do. So I want to fetch all the blocks that have, uh, that have the, the status to-do. Here, I have a query that looks for all the blocks that have a to-do in the status doing. If I click this to-do, so it changed to the status, you'll see it will jump to this query. Suddenly, I don't have any to-dos uh, anymore, but I have a task that is uh, in the doing status. I click it again, it jumps back to this query. So it's dynamic. It changes as soon as the status in a block changes. If I would uh, click done, you see it will jump to this query. So again, very useful. Uh, I use this basically to fetch all the to-dos that I have in a query. So even if I have to-dos on different journals pages um, that I never look at, I can still set up a query that will basically retrieve all the to-dos from, from my graph. All right, that was it.
that is basically the 20% of LuxSeq that will give you 80% of the results. Um, I know I went through it very fast. I've shown the, a lot in one hour. Honestly, when I first discovered, so I got to this way of note-taking through uh, Rome research. It took, I would estimate like around 30 to 40 hours be before I was really used to this way of, of writing notes. Hopefully this one hour has introduced you to all the things that are possible uh, that are that will support your workflows. So again, start with the journals page, just write in blocks. Uh, don't write everything on the same level. So in dense stuff, link to pages because when you link to pages, you can also use queries. Um, if anything, um, any, like you, you also want to combine your to-dos, just use queries in combination with to-dos. It's the simplest way to get started. Also because it's less fin finicky. You only have a few values you have. You have a to-do, you have the doing, and you have done. So that is basically uh, the, the, the core features of Loxy. All right. Are there any questions <laughs> about what I've just shown? Um, Amy, if you have time, can you explain about using properties? Uh, so I would recommend checking out the documentation. There's uh, information about page properties and just properties. So the, just the properties are for blocks to give you some information about page properties. Um, it works the following way. You have like the page properties are always, always, always in the first block of the page. Just see it as metadata. So it's information about the page as a whole. Um, links, normally I recommend if you just write on the page in individual blocks, you just use the double brackets like here. Um, you can still include it in queries, but you cannot use the page properties. Okay, what is a page property? The page property in this case are uh, manages phone and email. So these are page properties. These I can use in the query, what I've just shown uh, just now. I can basically create a little table based on the page properties. How do you write a property? Just like this, you have, uh, I don't know, um, last name and then double uh, colon. That is how you create a property. Look out, you cannot use spaces in your property name. So in this case, I've added a hyphen. So for example, last name, let me put this in here. Last name, Smith. And let me go back to the previous page with a query set page query, I can now also include last name. And as you can see here, last name Smith. It's not super advanced yet. Uh, like normally, personally, I would want to be able to drag this to, for example, the second column. Currently, that's not possible. Obviously, we're still at very early stage with, with this type of uh, data, but we are working on making it uh, more and more useful. But that is basically how you use page properties. Again, there are also properties that is on a block level. So then basically you can add metadata to a block. Um, do you need to add metadata to a block? Personally, I prefer to just add links to a block and then use the page properties to just give information about the page itself. Um, let's see. How does metadata compare with links slash hashtags? Uh, Dave asks, good question. Basically metadata, wh when you use metadata, you can create a table like this. So instead of uh, seeing it all in one giant list like this, with the page properties, you can actually create these tables. So that is the, the added benefit over uh, using page properties. More questions. Uh, Juan asks, can you force the page created at property? Um, what do you mean with that? Because it basically, 
uh, is created automatically. So um, I don't know how you would force it because it's created always when you create a page. Mm. Emmanuel's asking um, in your personal uh, case, what are you using properties for? Um, just metadata. So for example, it, when I have a, for example, book, I have book, maybe uh, the, 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 the subtitle of the book. So I have a subtitle property. I have the author property. I have uh, finished that. It's just some generic data about the, uh, the book. Um, some people really create really cool little, um, how do you say it? Uh, almost like workflows with it. So you could use it that way. You can have, for example, status. So if you're writing an article, you can have a status outline, status uh, uh, drafting, status edits. And then whenever you move it to the next stage, you just edit the metadata and then you can basically just have um, a, a, a bunch of uh, queries running on one page, like content calendar, and you can uh, show all the pages that have uh, status drafts, all the pages that have status outline, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that could be one use case. I'm not going to show it now because I would need to have a few minutes to set it up and we're already way over time. So, um, but this is a good question. I think I will do a follow-up session where I dive way deeper into queries where I basically we'll reserve an entire hour to show all the, uh, all the use cases for, for queries. I wanted to show it already, uh, but obviously it's a gigantic topic and this is basically the topic that confuses most people. So I, I will definitely need more time to uh, dive into it. Um, what else? Yeah, Juan, early days, indeed. Like we're still, we we built this and then obviously as people are starting to use it and we use it ourselves, we run into limitations and we look at, okay, how can we improve this? Um, any other questions? I will stay here for just a little bit longer. Yeah, Amy, definitely. Like when I asked what confuses you most about Logseq, it's queries. Like at least half of the people say queries. That confuses me. Um, I didn't want, like I wanted to touch on it because it's basically, it shows the power of, of this graph-based approach because everything is a block. You can basically just uh, like uh, 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 retrieve blocks based on their links. So that is why, why queries are very useful. I haven't shown the graph view because in my opinion, we are not there yet at all. Like you can have a graph view um, by just, let me see. So here's the graph view and that will show all the all the, the links that I have. But as you can see, it's not very powerful yet. So I don't, I don't like to look at this. <laughs> it, it should become more powerful. For now, I think uh, queries are one of the most powerful ways that you can use links apart from just jumping from link to link in your link references or using block uh, uh, references. Um, and another way to think about queries is it's just a safe search, safe search. Obviously you can create entire workflows uh, uh, around it. And that's what I want to show in another session, how I use it personally for content creation. So that will be very specific. Um, I also want to invite some other people who maybe have other uh, use cases where they use queries. So we'll dive into the basics of queries, spend way more time on the filters and combining them. And then I will show how I use it and then invite some other people to, to uh, use it. 